Hey everybody, it's Mark Schultz here, and I am here this morning with my co-host Larry Little. Good morning, Larry. How are you? Hey, Mark. Happy to be with you again today. Hey, Larry. It is a beautiful day in Seattle, sunny, and I hear you're going to go out and fly your airplane today. Yeah, I'm going to take the 172 up to some islands uh, a little bit north of here this afternoon for uh, probably just a cup of coffee. Beautiful day. Beautiful day. Hey, one of these days you're going to have to take me up there. I'd like to get up there and see that. <laughs> we got to do that, Mark. We got to yeah, do that. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, we are here for another episode, a LinkedIn Live episode of Recovery in Aviation. We are totally focused on recovery in aviation and being a positive voice in aviation, helping to accelerate aviation. This is a live broadcast on LinkedIn. And so you are going to have the opportunity to interact with our guests today and to be able to comment and ask your questions. And so this is a live broadcast. So you'll be able to put your comments in down below um, during the program. We're going to take your comments and address those questions live um, here today. So don't miss out on that. Hey, also help us out. Share this broadcast because when you share it, we get out to a broader audience. We are getting so many people that are reaching out to me and saying they're interested in this subject of recovery in aviation. We are starting to see some activity out there, and we're really excited. We're going to have a conversation in just a minute about that. Hey, before we um, talk about what's happening in the industry, let's go ahead and bring our special guest in today. And uh, in this edition here today of Recovery in Aviation, I'm pleased to introduce Colby Harvey. He's CEO of the company Rise. Hey, Harvey, or hey, Colby, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, Mark. Thank you. Great. Hey, where are you located today? Uh, I'm in Austin, Texas, actually. It's a nice sunny day here, too. So, Austin, Texas. Great. Hey, Colby, before we get started, um, just tell us uh, what's your position and what does your company do? Quick synopsis. Sure. Uh, so again, my name is Colby Harvey. I'm the CEO of, over here at Rise. Uh, so Rise is an innovative drone technology startup focused on the innovation of the aircraft inspection process. Great. Good. We are really glad to have you on the program today here because I think you got some really good insights on how um, your technology can help leverage and accelerate recovery in aviation. But before we get into that, we want to just have a little bit of a discussion about the industry. And, uh, uh, you know, um, we are seeing, you know, still, we're seeing a lot of airplanes on the ground and, um, you know, everybody gets concerned about that. And a lot of what we see on the news out there is, you know, bad news about what's happening in aviation, all right? Well, we know there's, you know, there's negative things that are happening, but we choose to recover we choose to focus on recovery and on acceleration. And Larry, hey, listen, I always count on you to take a, a good look at the news and what's going on out there today. What are we seeing out there today that's really positive about what's happening in aviation today? Well, yeah, Mark, I was going to kind of bring up a couple of things. Uh, you know, last, last, actually this week out of China, international flights in and out of China, 134 international flights in and out of China. Next week, beginning the first week of June, they're planning 407 flights, international flights, in and out of China. So uh, we're, I think what we're seeing that across the, across the, you know, across the globe is more and more international travel. People being feeling more comfortable getting on the airplane and airlines, you know, not not just Chinese airlines, but across the, you know, across the industry are are looking to get more and more flights uh, going on a daily basis. Yeah, no question, no question. Hey, Colby, you mentioned to me this morning that you saw that some of the countries were opening up as well to receive traffic. What did you see out there? Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what I saw too. So like Italy and Greece are, are starting to open up their international flights as well. I mean, it, personally, from my experience, I, I just recently flown back too. And honestly, I've never felt so safer on a plane. Oh, so that's right. You, uh, you just last week, I think, flew from California to Austin, right? I did, I did. So Tell us about your experience. So tell the tell the viewers about your experience. What happened when you got on that airplane? Sure. So the airplanes are very clean. The, the you know the precautions and the steps that these airlines are taking are you know incredible to make sure that the safety of their passengers and their crew are are you know at the top of the forefront. So even boarding from the back first and you know making sure not to um, fill in middle aisles, it, it, it does make it feel comfortable enough to to fly. 
Yeah, we, we definitely have seen that. Larry, um, you know, you pointed out to me a couple of times that the, all the major airlines have coming out with major cleaning programs. And, you know, I think Delta Airlines came out with something, you know, about a month ago. What was that program called again? You know, you know Delta, Delta actually came out with something that they branded Delta Clean. And yeah. I guess I've seen other airlines, you know, kind of do the same thing. Air Canada has a similar program uh, and, and, you know, United American are coming out with similar programs. And these are not, they're, they're marketing. Yes, of course, they're marketing. Yeah. But they're also really... Yeah. Um, making the airplane cleaner, not just from the touch standpoint, but also filters and all that that, that uh, yeah. you know goes into having good quality and cleanliness within the airplane. So, hey, Colby, you felt comfortable getting on that airplane? Yeah, very, very much so. You know, HEPA filters, cleaning, very comfortable. Yeah, very good. And like we said, we're seeing international traffic increase, you know, in Asia and, uh, you know, in Europe. And, and, uh, and we're also, you know, we're also seeing schedules. I'm seeing domestic airlines um, in June and July, you know, increasing their schedules pretty dramatically. I had some friends that, that flew to Kansas last week on Sunday, and they said, we want to get down there now before the traffic gets really heavy, you know. So, I know people want to fly. People are interested in flying. And so I know that we are going to see an increase over the next couple of months in flying. Now, listen, we still know there's a lot of challenges. And so that's why we're talking about this and we're bringing into focus, um, you know, what can we all do in order to be able to accelerate recovery, you know, in aviation. And one of the reasons that we brought um, Colby on the show today with RISE is because they have some interesting technology and they've told us about some things which they are going to be able to help the industry to accelerate, to be able to enable acceleration um, of recovery, you know, through some of their technology. Now, um, Colby, um, I know that you have some technology which you are using in the area of aircraft maintenance, all right? Can you tell us a little bit about your company and, you know, your tagline of your company is advanced robotics and AI company, all right? What is that all about? Right. And that, that, that's a great question. So what we're doing is specifically in the aviation space is, you know, we're, we're working to optimize a, um, an older maintenance process that can definitely, that's definitely the need of innovation and making it much more safe for not just the um, employees, but also for the aircraft. And, and ultimately we're adding that additional layer of security for the airlines to show to their customers that, Hey, we're taking these precautions to inspect our aircraft, to ensure their flight, they're airworthy, and they're able to take you to where you need to go. Now, now you said you're taking an older process. Now we're doing, you know, we're used to doing visual inspections on airplanes. All right, we got a lot, lot of airplanes that are on the ground right now, and they're mm -hmm. going to be coming out, and there's going to need to be a lot of visual inspections of those airplanes. I saw, I saw a, a photograph on LinkedIn, um, I think yesterday, of a uh, of an aircraft with a bird's nest in it, you know, and so with these airplanes sitting on the ground, we definitely have challenges with bringing these aircraft, you know, back into service again. Now, so visual inspections were the name of the game, and you are bringing a new capability to the table, which is inspection yeah. through new technology. How? Right. So we're using a, autonomous robotics, uh, and we developed an, an entirely unique platform specifically tailored for the aviation industry to specifically address this issue of looking for bird's nests, of looking for any hail strikes or lightning damage that these aircraft, either if they were in service or if they're just seen on the ground um, and they go through a hailstorm, making sure that, again, we're keeping those aircraft flight worthy uh, to be able to re-enter service as quick as possible. Now, Larry, you know, we've been at, you know, you and I worked at Boeing for a long time and I've worked yeah. a lot of places, but, but, uh, you know, when we put an aircraft on the ground, you know, there's some uh, activities that have to happen to get it out of storage, right? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of processes that you have to go through and they're all documented processes that you have to do to put that airplane into storage. And then there's those the same processes that you have to go through to, uh, to get that airplane out, out of storage. And I, you know, I think Colby, we see all these airplanes that are parked they have to have run into each other at some point and has some damage. So I think, you know, the, uh, the drone technology or being able to, you know, to do that autonomously, it's not only, it's not only a better way to do it, it's more efficient, but it just happens quicker too. Okay. Well, you know, so let's, let's talk about those drones for a minute because um, I think I want the people, the viewers to really understand, you know, what it is that you have, and then we'll talk about the application of it. So, so here we have a, a, an image of, uh, you know, one of your drones. Um, can you just give us a little bit of an explanation of, of just some of the features and what we're looking at here right now? Sure. So our drone is, a, is built on a uni, unibody platform. You know, we, we utilize a, a multitude of different sensing systems to ensure the safety and reliability of the product. As you can see, there's a, these that the bright yellow um, 
um, prop guard is just to ensure that it's it's highly visible to anyone that's walking around it to ensure there's you know no one mistakes it or gets too close to to potentially hurt themselves or um, damage the aircraft in any way. So um, so so Colby, yeah. so then uh, mm -hmm. and like I'm particular on 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 this drone here. So how many props are there on a drone like this? Right. So this our prop this drone um, is has about has four motors on it to ensure about a 20 minute flight time around the aircraft um, to complete an inspection. So what, what are the key focuses that we want to do is increase efficiency. And with this um, in mind and safety in mind, we were able to reduce the inspection uh, time by about 90 percent, depending on uh, narrow body to wide body. So 90%. So let, let me key on that a little bit. What do you mean reduce it by 90%? What, how, does, how does using a drone reduce the amount of inspection time required? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So drones are, are, are capable of just, you know, it's a one touch solution, one touch launch. It launches, it localizes itself with the, inside of the hangar uh, or whatever environment that the end user wants to utilize. Uh, and it then begins its, uh, its its flight paths. So its flight paths take about an hour to complete. Again, this depends on the size of the aircraft, but um, as opposed to you know traditional ways of inspections that take between anywhere between six to ten hours. Okay. All right. Well, that's uh, that's great. That's um that's really interesting. You know, Mark, uh, from my standpoint, it's just uh, you know we've talked about drone technology and using drones to do it for inspections for a long, long time. You know, Colby, to see you actually actually doing it and, and reaping some of those efficiencies is really refreshing. Appreciate that. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. So, um, hey, let me let me point out to our viewers right now is is that remember um, uh, at the, some point in time in the program we are going to take questions you know directly and live and um, we do that. And the last the last one I did we had a lot of questions and uh, it really creates a lot of really good interaction. So if you have questions for Colby or Larry or myself, um, feel free to put them into the comments. We actually see them right here and uh, we will answer your questions live. We'll read them and answer your questions live. So. Don't be don't be afraid to do that. We're ready to do that. So um, listen, as we continue to go on, I want to ask a couple other questions about the uh, about the drone, you know, itself. Um, Colby, this next image that we have uh, shows, you know, some of the body or some of the camera. Can you talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing here? What um, you know, what am I looking at here as far as optics like that? Or what do I have here? Yeah, sure. So you're looking at a, a design that we're extremely proud of um, in terms of, you know, just the overall the quality and the finishes of the product. So when, when it comes to when we're talking about the camera, the, the camera from about a three foot distance away from the aircraft is able to detect a minimum like feature of about one millimeter across. So I'm, that, I'm talking about looking at damages that are light, that are very pin pin point in size. You know, normal people may overlook that. The drone has the capability of identifying that and category, category, uh, excuse me, categorizing that um, and retaining that information uh, and, and transmitting it to the, uh, the end user. So from this design right, right now, we can see, you know, the, the landing gear that's been carefully and meticulously thought out um, onto the power and, and arming switches to um, the battery compartment on the top, uh, which again, uh, provides a, about a 20 minute flight time about 22 to 23 minutes without the prop guards, but um, it's we're not, you know, it's much more comfortable for uh, end users to utilize a drone with the prop guards, at least in the early stages until they're much more comfortable with um, it um, interacting with their uh, equipment and their personnel. But so yeah, so from what you're seeing here, we, the, the camera has a full 360 uh, gimbal to swivel, swivel so we can inspect the top the sides uh, and the bottom of the, the aircraft uh, and gather and collect all that information. Uh, and report that you know process it with our image our imaging technologies and and uh, um, AI technologies on the back end uh, and we also have the ability to live stream um, the the images as they're going so the the inspector can always see what the drone is doing at any given time yeah and Colby uh, you know in this process that you have of you're essentially creating a digital twin of the airplane how does the yeah. drone know where it is uh, how do you kind of spatially know where the drone is Right, and, and that's a that's a really great question. So, you know, one of the hardest things in, um, I guess, drone technology, artificial intelligence, robotics technologies is localization, especially localization in GPS denied environments, which is something that uh, we'd like to pride ourselves as our, our, our bread and butter. We use a multitude of sensing solutions, one key one being our, our LiDAR system and it, its field of view uh, to localize the aircraft, to localize um, different um, artifacts around the the hangar to identify where the drone is and begin its inspections. Okay. 
Okay. Hey, listen, quick question is I found, I've actually had people on the program tell me they appreciate it when we, you know, speak in layman's kind of terms. And I know sometimes when we talk about things, um, you know, people may not understand you talk about LIDAR and you talk about things like that. Can you explain what you're really talking about when you say something like that? What, what is LIDAR? Sure. So uh, a LIDAR system, essentially what it does is creates a, uh, a non-visual like, like uh, image of what what's going on around, and it does this by shooting out, you know, however many lasers may be inside of that lidar, being 16, 32, 128, and it creates a picture, uh, and that picture is called a 3D point cloud, and we can use that to create actual models of the aircraft uh, while it's while it's um so for excuse me for localization to actually find the specific waypoints and key points that we've already pre-programmed and that's also assisted by our artificial intelligence uh, to uh, inspect that aircraft or inspect that specific part of the aircraft that you want to that you want to look at okay so is this so are you able to kind of are you oh. able to determine the size of damage i assume that you can do that as well yeah so the only the only thing that uh it, that we are working on right now, that's a really a, a big selling point for the industry is being able to do those dent maps, being able to understand uh, how yeah. the depth of the dent. So we're able to measure the length and width. Uh, the dent The dent is something that's in our development process. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. so, so Colby, just a quick question is, is that, uh, is this is this drone using video technology or laser technology or how, what, what's, what is it actually capturing? So it's a, it's a multimodal motor system. So um, it, it is using actually all of the above. So it's, it's using the, those image data, the barometer data, it's using the LIDAR data um, and, and taking all of this and, and a very sophisticated algorithm that, that we've developed um, for that localization. So it, again, so it can identify that aircraft and, and how to move around it effectively and also avoid uh, obstacles, which is something that, you know, um, it's generally pretty hard to do with just photogrammetry alone. So photogrammetry is just using photos to measure distances. Um, now adding that, that, that next level of sensor being the LIDAR gives us that flexibility to be able to, to work in heavy and restrictive environments where there's scaffolding around, where there's um, uh, skyjacks around and, and really just make sure that we complete the inspection um, in the most optimal fashion and also reverting back when something needs to be done or interacted by that, the end user. Okay, so that kind of precision and accuracy. Hey, listen, um, as things come in, I wanna just throw questions up and I know it always places our guests in a little bit of an awkward position because you never know what people are gonna ask Colby, but it's always good, you know? It's like standing on the stage and asking for questions. You always, you always get someone to ask questions, all right? So anyway, yeah. hey, we have a question that came up here. I always wanna throw it up on the screen real quick. And uh, we have a question for the, here that says, uh, what kind of inspections, you know, paintings and markings can you do with your damage detection system? So what kind of inspections are you actually doing, you know, with the, the system at this point? Yeah, I think, you know, I really appreciate the question. So the type of inspections that we're actually doing, we're looking for damages such as lightning strikes, hail strikes. We're looking at regulatory marks for any types of, you know, damages or uh, that, that needs to be addressed. So, I mean, really the, the main G GVI inspection, so those are the general visual inspections that normal inspectors are looking for, is the same thing that the drone is looking for as well. Okay, all right, great. Well, thanks, I appreciate them asking that question. We have a few more questions coming in. I'll just maybe uh, you know bring it out. Here, um, there's one from just a general LinkedIn user here. It doesn't have the person's name, but one thing we didn't address is, is what's your market area that you're focusing on? This person is in South America. One of the cool things about these broadcasts that we do is I literally get people from everywhere from Asia to South America, North America, and Europe and Middle East you know, that, that are on these broadcasts. And this person is in South America. And they're basically saying, hey, um, nice presentation. There's some local companies in South America. They would appreciate help on some projects. You know, what is your, you know, market focus today? Where are you making your products and services available? So the, the products and services are, are, are available uh, globally. As you know, you know, the aviation industry is, is huge, obviously. So and it's very small and very tight knit as well. So our, our product focus isn't just for American or U.S. based airlines or Europe based airlines or MROs. It's for um, whatever customer is in need of these types of technologies or in need of these types of innovations inside of their facilities, that's who we focus for. Those those market leaders that want to integrate uh, and push the bar forward um, with what technology can do and what they're implementing inside of their own uh, facilities. 
Yeah, one of the amazing things, of course, about social media and about marketing and what we can do today with video is we can reach people all around the world. We, you know, I'm not, we have a guy who just commented here. He says, I'm watching this from Rwanda, you know, and so, you know, we, we, we have people all over the world, you know, that, uh, that are watching broadcasts. And, and so, you know, it's really great that as a global company that you can address the needs, you know, worldwide. So the bottom line is, is that, you know, you're addressing needs of the industry as a whole around the world, then is what you're saying. Yes, sir. Exactly. Okay. That's really fantastic. All right, great. Hey, let's go back a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the about the drone and about the inspection processes and things like that, because I think a lot of people have questions about maybe the capabilities or the limitations. And and so um, let's talk a little bit about safety for a minute. So, you know, you have multiple props and motors on the device. I mean, what happens if uh, the drone is flying and you have a failure? Does it just fall out of the sky? What's the situation? No, so that's a, that's a really great question. So our, our chief science officer is a, a previous NASA engineer and, and worked with uh, mathematically proven safety algorithms that we are work, that we we've integrated inside of our drone platform. So what the drone does is, let's say, if it detects the onboard computer detects an issue with one of the props or or something, what it does is it uses the sensors on board, including the lidar, including the camera, to identify the the safest area for a controlled precision crash as possible to make sure it's away from the aircraft to make sure it's away from people. So we're using implementing technology that's been that's been proven and fault tolerant on um, space ready, uh, mission ready um, aircraft and uh, um, devices. Hey Colby, we don't ever use the word controlled crash, okay? It's a controlled <laughs> crash. <laughs> <laughs> Control, right. Hey, you know, Mark, while we're talking about operation of the drone, uh, you know, one thing that we've always, that we've talked about a lot with drones is, oh, they're great in a hangar. They're great in a hangar environment. We can see them. But a lot of times you might want to dent and buckle chart out on the line, right? You know, uh, yeah. at the gate. How, have you guys had any experience uh, operating outside the hangar? So and that's that's a really, really, really great question. And that's something that, you know, we've been pushing through even with some of our, our current um uh, early adopting customers uh, on the way. Um, so the biggest draw for our customers is that, you know, being able to utilize the drone in those line maintenance environments and out on the runway. So we've been, you know, I've, I've, we've identified uh, uh, different uh, leadership within FAA, the FAA to, uh, and with our customers to work with, you know, specific municipalities, specific airports so that we can uh, do tr at least quote unquote trial tests on the on the runway because you know as you know the FAA has you know right now they're you know pretty much against letting drones on the active runway um, right. but that that you know in my vision from what I see that that will be quickly shifting and quickly changing um, as the ties go on especially you know moving forward as the the technology is 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 more proven um, and we have bigger people behind us to to you know. To champion us in front yeah, of them. Drones are just like any other technology. They're making improvements in those things every day. Mm, yeah, constantly. Yeah, All that's really. Yeah, I've seen a lot of really significant safety improvements in uh, you know drones. There's no question about that. But we all know, you know, that one of the realities is that the regulatory requirements are very strict around airports. I mean, you know, they don't they don't allow antennas. They don't allow drones flying around there. And so, so um, you know, we know we all know we have some challenges in order to be able to address you know the, the one of those needs of running drones you know on the ramp or or out uh, in the airport areas but i i also agree is, is that that uh, that will change quickly is that here here listen here's my own personal advice is is that we have always found our regulators to be reasonable as long as we can present them with you know safe and reasonable practices which will enable us to be able to operate in those conditions and so i don't mm -hmm. think we should ever back away from those things we should identify the need. We should we should address the challenges that surround, you know, operating in those kind of environments. Draw in our regulators and engage them in conversation about what it takes to be able to operate in those environments. I mean, you know, Colby, what's your position on that? No, I I completely agree. I'm like you're you're, you're never going to get any like anywhere if you don't engage with the people. You you can't just push it out and, and and hope for the best. You have to make sure that we are actively engaged. And this is this isn't just with me in general. This is for industry and other startups or other companies uh, looking to do this. You know, you have we have to work with them to ensure that we are providing a safe, viable form of you know for me specific inspection methods. Um, it, it, that's including you know taking a year's worth of data, you know, we've identified this much damage. We haven't fallen or crashed ever out of a thousand, two thousand flights that we've ever had. 
presenting it to the regulators and showing them, hey, this is a safe solution that we should work to integrate within our normal practices. Hey, um, Colby, continuing this discussion around regulators, we have another question that came in. I just want to throw it up real quick. Is um, The question here is, is that, um, is this an approved method by authorities as an inspection method? So, so is using a drone approved by our regulators as an alternative to eyes on damage or something like that? So, yeah, that's a great question. So when it comes to general visual inspections, they're always, as, as the, the FARs are written right now, there always has to be an inspector that reviews the data. That doesn't mean, with that being said, the inspector's still reviewing the data. The inspector that's is still reviewing the data that's coming off of our drone, that's coming the reviewing the videos. So the drone isn't actually the one that's signing off and saying, hey, stamp of approval, this is good to go. The inspector is. So that's one way to, to think about it. And it kind of goes around that, but uh, it is definitely something that I'm working towards and several of my uh, early adopters and customers are working for towards as well. But as of now, it, it, it it's an inspection method that can be used as in conjunction with a, a human um, component. Hey, Mark, just to follow up on that. Hey, you know, Kobe, we're all working from home. Uh, Mark's in front of his brick wall and, and I'm in my kitchen. Can an inspector do the inspection from home? Technically, yes. Um, if the if the drone's in the in the right place and you know has the is charged. Uh, we're, we're working on another solution where we have like a quick charge case for the drone yeah, uh, as well. Yeah. So they can always review it, It's, you know, since everyone's working home from home from COVID and we want to have, let's say they want to have two eyes on the inspector or the inspection of the drone to make sure nothing got lost with well, other inspectors at home. They can also always review the video from home and say, Hey, I found these things that you missed as well. Well, the AI might've missed. Yeah, you know, that's really not an uncommon practice. I mean, for years, you know, we have engineers and maintenance control operations that are remote and we have a mechanic out on the line who, you know, snaps a photograph of something and then sends it off to engineering or to maintenance control. And they make a determination based on visual inspections of the picture or SRM, you know, structure repair manual limits. I mean, so that's really a common practice. So I, I really don't see this as a deviation at all from that, Colby. It's, yeah. it's just an extension of it. You're right, Mark. Yeah. It really yeah. is. It is. Hey, listen, we got some more really good questions coming in. I want to just note here. Um, hey, I got my good friend, uh, Stefan Fossler um, from Austria, from Vienna here. We've worked together in the past and uh, he has a great company called E-Wings. They're a uh, blockchain company, but um, he's a, he has a quick question here. He says, uh, which data standards are you looking to provide digital inspection records and link them to different systems that the MRO operators are using? So, if I could just, you know, interpret that a second is, is that, you know, what about data standards and integration to other MRO systems? What are you doing in that area, Colby? Right. So we, we use a secure, uh, secure transfer method. So I've actually, you know, have a personal friend here that has a, a blockchain security company too. That's actually really, really interesting. And these are things that I've definitely been toying around with. So having those active ledgers um, and making sure everything that's, you know, that's transmitted back to our system and ensuring nothing's tampered with and then return back to the end user is definitely something that's, you know, it's high on our on our radar for security standards. So when it when it comes that's we use a um, and I can't give you the the, the exact um, data encryption standard um, right now, but everything is can is transferred back to our securely through our um, our cloud pipeline to our cloud infrastructure. Um, and any of the operations or the tools that um, the airlines or the MROs are using will, you know, include like webhooks or whatever they may need in order to integrate with the specific systems. Uh, so we can transfer information back to, it's an EMRO platform like Trax or, or EMRO, whatever it may be. Uh, so the, we, we wanna ensure that we have security from, from end to end. Uh, and, and, and blockchain is definitely something that I am, I, I've been thinking about and toying around with my head and, and my, with my team uh, to use to encrypt our data transfer methods. So I think I think you maybe said it, Cody, but you've actually you can actually integrate with Trax or Amos or a, or an ERP system as well with the data that you're creating. Yeah, with the data that we're creating, yeah. So we're working on um, APIs to actually have that integration, but in, like at this moment, we we don't have full integration uh, quite yet. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. You know, we've had other MRO system uh, software companies on the on our broadcast. Like we recently had a, a broadcast with Ramco, you know, and uh, Aerosoft, and both of them as well as Trax and Amos and others have uh, systems which you know our, our industry used as their ERP systems or their systems of record. And of course, you know, having an easy integration with those systems is definitely a value 
for creating efficiency, Colby. So that sounds like that's a great area for you guys to continue to focus on. Yeah, and we want to ensure that we have immediate customer the the ease. We want to make sure that the product is that we deliver to our our customers is as easy to use and as efficient and as reliable uh, as you know any other as any other method that they use to record their information. We we want to make sure it's a seamless um, integration process. So um, I have a couple of other questions that have come in, but to set it up a little bit, I want to go off in a little bit of a different direction. Um, so we know that you're doing inspection of the aircraft and you're creating a database or a repository of in information. Well, let me rephrase that. You're creating inputs into a database or repository of information, um, you know, of maybe damage or inspection kind of results. There's a lot of systems that are out there today and uh, those systems um, might produce dent and buckle reports or, you know, different capturing of, of records. And so let's let's take a quick look at you know, uh, an image of your software here. That's what we have on the screen right now. Now, Colby, on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm seeing a picture of an aircraft um, with some hard points marked on it. What am I looking at here? Can you kind of describe that to me? Right, so you, what you're seeing there is the areas of um, interest that the, the artificial intelligence uh, has picked up and the computer vision has identified as areas with potential damage um, or damage or damages that it may not know quite yet uh, and needs uh, assistance with potentially. So the way that the platform is developed and the way that it was it was designed uh, was to be a continuously learning um, um, algorithm and model. So what you're seeing here is, let's say we look at the left wing, as the drone says it's identified, you know, three pieces of damage there. If you, you go and click there to give you the image of the actual like damage and the corresponding uh, image sets uh, beforehand, it will give you the artificial intelligence will recommend what it believes that the damage to be based on uh, images that we've used to train it with and data sets that we use to train it with. Uh, and if it's incorrect, it, it doesn't just continue. It allows you to actually actively update that uh, with the list of approved uh, verbiage that we have for what the type of damage uh, it actually is. And that goes back and retroactively trains our artificial intelligence model. Uh, ultimately, this application, uh, th there's been uh, quite a few updates too as well. Uh, and, and we're working to have uh, t uh, 2D image stitching. So this won't just be a, a blank like A320 that's sitting here. You actually see the image of the aircraft as it was inspected um, as a three-dimensional model. You know, this, that's a, this is a really great dent and buckle, a uh, way to do dent and buckle that's just so much more reliable, I think, Kobe, than what we have today. And it kind of also gives you the the you know the vision to think about what's next can i take one of those blue dots and then can i see you know what was actually done or what the structural repair manual might say so it gives you the ability to start having those what if conversations yeah and, and that's a that's a big integration point and especially works for you know even with training of new uh, new technicians you know yeah. it goes and finds a damage you know, we've, we've proven that, you know, we found this damage hundreds of thousands of times. The artificial intelligence knows that this is the type of damage that it actually is. Well, what we, when we go into customer facilities, we work to integrate with their, their SRMs and their SMMs and, you know, OEM manuals as well to provide uh, the correct course of action or direct them to the, you know, wherever it is in that manual to how to actually repair that damage that it's identified. Absolutely. Yeah. That's hey, great. Um, great. Colby, let me uh, let me tie this into a couple of questions that have come in on on sort of a subject here. Um, so one of the questions that came in here has to do with um, our data that's really in the database. And so you know, um, so you might have uh, I've worked with dent and buckle or rec record systems which have um, you know wireframes or they have some some uh, initial data that's in the system and uh, and you know you have to you have to uh, identify where the damage is and what are the structural limits and things like that. But um, one of the questions that's come up was what if what if you're, um, what is the setup that's required? What if you're trying to capture something that isn't necessarily in there and the artificial intelligence, you know, hasn't really taken into consideration? So let's make this a two-part question. How do we set up a system to be able to do inspections? And then how does that get followed on with artificial intelligence that might result from the data that it's capturing? Right, and yeah, and that's a very good question. Uh, it's gonna make it a little technical. So when it goes into our artificial intelligence algorithm, so we use you know multiple AI data sets that we like AI algorithms that we've um, developed using open source platforms, um, and some that you know we've developed in ten, uh, internally using uh, mathematical models that we've we've done. Uh, but the, the, set, the setup is initially, you know, taking it, you know, taking inspections and scans that we've used, and we, we've worked with 
uh, inspectors at our our you know development partner site you know to, to to work to train those specific models. The AI is looking for anything um, with out of out of like let's say like color context on the fuselage of the aircraft, um, and so, which is you know starts to get a little little difficult with specific lighting the hangar, but. Uh, we've identified several methods to kind of filter some of those things out. Um, but the things that it doesn't recognize, it will still let you know. It will give you a, a red box or an item and say, hey, I'm like this is, you know, we aren't able to identify what the specific thing is. Would you be able to to double check this uh, and, and, and um, identify the type of damage? And then we use also use uh, federated learning uh, so, you know, whatever is taught or, you know, was updated through one drone or, or, or one um, application uh, goes back and is updated throughout our entire uh, AI um, fleet on our back end infrastructure. So, hey, as a, as a small follow up to that question, um, you know, right down here, let me get that one up on the screen real quick, if we could, is uh, uh, Mr. Laramie here, he, uh, he says, is it, have you done any comparative studies on the same aircraft between human inspections and your system? So, so as we're trying to demonstrate to our regulators that visual human visual inspections are better or worse, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that, is, is that if drone inspections have, have equal capability or greater capability, have you done any comparisons so that we can understand um, you know, what we get by doing drone inspections as compared to human eyes on a, on a, uh, a defect? Right. And, and that's benchmark testing. So we, we always have to do benchmark testing. So these are things. So those types of tests are always ongoing. So as we continue to, um, you know, um, move further along uh, and the, the release of the, the product and getting things out there, we, we are working with our our um, partners and, and our um, early adopters for those comparative tests. So we so we have uh, begun those, and they're, they're always again they're always going to be ongoing uh, just to ensure exactly what you're saying, Mark. That you know we can prove that the drone has the ability to detect just as much, if not more, than a, than uh, a normal person can. Yeah, and uh, hey, Larry, um, you know I know that when you were at Boeing, you worked with uh, some of the applications out there that um, captured structural damage and, uh, you know, we're able to produce dent and buckle reports. I know that's extremely critical to, um, you know, aircraft documentation and returning aircraft to lease. I mean, what's your thoughts on the value of, of having, you know, better records and documentation, you know, of the aircraft itself? Well, you know, Mark, that's a, that's a good question. And there's several perspectives here. Uh, you know, we had one airline that we were working with and they, uh, they, they were turning a 737 back to the leasing company. It had a repair, an external repair on, on, um, on the airframe, and they couldn't find the records for that repair. Um, obviously, they were in paper somewhere, uh, and so they ended up having to take that repair off and redo the repair and have it recertified, and it cost about, uh, about $50,000 just to do that one process. So wow. if you lose one repair, $50,000, uh, and I mean, Having these things documented electronically so you don't lose them is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and hey, I, I just want to along these same lines. Yeah, uh, cool. you know, one another uh, thing that we that we always worry about with this type of inspection is the size of the data sets. How do you move such such large masses of data, if you will, around? Yeah, that and that's that is honestly one of the ultimate questions too. So they they are we the the data sets that are generated, especially even just with the lidar, are are, are massive. So right. you know, in our platform, what what we do is for areas or hangars that aren't equipped with you know Wi-Fi or or internet services, we, we you know we we offer you know cell service. So we, we're we're partnering. We're going to partner partner with uh, major um, carriers, uh, phone cellular carriers to. Uh, integrate, you know, 4G, LTE, you know, potentially, hopefully, you know, once we start getting more of the infrastructure, 5G, uh, to to be able to to dump the data. So the data, unfortunately, since, since it's such a large set of data, um, doing it while the drone is flying is uh, is is a bit inefficient. So we 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 decided to uh, complete the the data uploads via just a, a mass the dump at the end of the uh, the platform. So and it goes again to our our, our cloud computing architecture, which uh, you know this is it's cloud computing has been you know an amazing advancement in our technology. So when it comes to like you were saying, not losing any of the data, uh, we we make sure the the data is, is replicated 
uh, across multiple multiple regions, so that you know the, you, there's no worry that any data will ever be lost uh, that the whatever the drone captures. So hey, Colby, is this data coming off the um, drone live, or is it coming off on some kind of physical media, or what? How, right. What's happening with the capture and the delivery of the information? So the the data we, we, again, we want I wanted to make this to make sure the platform was again as easy uh, and to use as possible. So there there's no removal of any SD cards. Um, there's no removing any like media. It's all done wirelessly. Uh, the drone again, it, it, it's all done once it's captured through the you know the application or once it's just kind of pulled off the drone and just uploaded to the cloud at that point. Okay, well, good. Well, um, so, you know, it's all been really very interesting. I think that there's a tremendous opportunity, you know, to be able to Sorry, help the industry. I don't understand. <laughs> That's what happens when you leave your Google home on. It's talking to me in the middle of, <laughs> in the middle of a question. Automation doesn't work perfectly all the time, does it? <laughs> no, not at all. Have you ever tried to speak to text? It's awful. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so, hey, listen, um, uh, you know, as we're looking at drone technology and as we're looking at uh, the opportunity that we have to be able to uh, accelerate recovery, I mean, obviously you've shown us how, um, how inspections can be accomplished, you know, more rapidly or more efficiently um, using, you know, drone kind of inspection technology. So that's really fantastic. And you've talked about how the reduction of time, you know, can help um, accelerate that, you know, we can capture images, which can we can send off to you know engineers or you know for people to evaluate, and so I do think there's a tremendous opportunity for using this enabling technology to be able to help in acceleration and recovery, you know, within aviation. So it's really really pretty amazing. So um, Colby, let me kind of focus this discussion back again toward you again and your company. Is is that these are hard times, and uh, we all know that we're going to have to find efficiencies in the industry in order to be able to operate in this new environment that we're in. Is is it? What is your own? What is your own advice, or what is your company doing in order to be able to internally be able to operate more efficiently, and how can that be translated to our audience and how their companies can operate more efficiently? Sure. So you know, aside from the the you know standard you know try to be as conservative and run as lean as possible, you know, we want to make sure that you are keep making sure that your, 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 your employees are happy and they're taken care of because honestly, from what I've noticed, and we have a, a small team that's, that's very close that when, you, when everyone's on the same page, everyone works, works more effectively. Um, and just, just ensure that you are adhering to uh, your, your uh, standards that are set forth right now. So for example, you know, you know, if you have the ability to work from home and it, it doesn't infer too much and, impact too much of your workflow, go ahead and do that. For us, it, it, it hasn't really stopped anything. Um, uh, when we need to do field tests, we do field tests, but we make sure again, we're, we're, we're safe about it. We, you know, we're, we're being safe. So, and, and just make sure that you are looking at all options available to you. So make sure you're not just focusing in, in one bucket. So for us, we're, RISE is doing this by, you know, we're not just looking at the commercial markets of uh, aviation. We're also looking at U.S. military. We're also looking at you know either you know railway inspections or pipeline or you know other types of um, things that we can potentially uh, revert to uh, as need to to ensure that we are staying viable in the in the industry and as a company. So you have some diversification into other um, other industries Perfect, yeah. like defense. Yes, sir. That's fantastic. All right. Well, very good. All right. Well, that's uh, that's all really great advice. So, um, you know, kind of as we begin to sort of wrap this up today, I um, I wanted to, you know, go to you, Larry. Is it Larry? What's your reaction of this, uh, you know, drone technology and its inspection capability and what kind of impact it can have on our efficiency in doing inspections in the industry? Well, yeah, thanks, Mark. A couple of thoughts. Everybody loves talking about drones, right? They're just really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's uh, from, from my standpoint, you know, having seen this technology evolve over the past, uh, I'm going to say five, five, five years, to see it move to production to actually bring efficiencies uh, is really special. Yeah. And hey, Colby, just um, as a kind of final comment uh, from you as well, I wanted to ask you is, is that, you know, why did you go into drone inspection? What do you think you can bring to the industry by offering drone inspection in the industry? Yeah. So I went to drone inspections for several reasons. I wanted to combine my, 
my technical background, uh, being an ex um, uh, Google engineer and uh, and my, my passion for aviation, uh, I really want to find a way to bring those two together uniquely uh, to create a, a solution that could help an industry. Because I, you know, being uh, I, I grew up in the in aviation family, so I've seen firsthand, you know, maintenance practices and you know, kind of walking through the hangar uh, with my with my my dad and uh, and seeing what goes on there. So it really just provided me this sense of you know not just responsibility but like excitement to to bring something revolutionary to the market plus drones are also like you know like Larry was saying they're really cool <laughs> and we've only really scratched the surface of what they can do yeah absolutely hey you know um all three of us are actively involved in aviation you know um all three of us are a pilot Larry is the most active pilot right now and you know aviation is a passion for us and uh, and I completely understand and respect your desire to be engaged in aviation you know through drones and 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 uh, finding a way to be able to help aviation to be successful because for those of us that have caught the aviation bug you know it's more of an obsession than it is a passion really you know we want to see aviation continue to be you know successful and i really see technologies like this like drone technologies and looking for opportunities to apply these technologies to regular problems that we've had for a long long time as being a way that we can accelerate recovery in aviation and that we can help create success in aviation, even in difficult times. And so I wanted to compliment you, um, you know, Colby and your business and what you guys are doing. I think that you really have the ability to be able to help people. And I really encourage those of you that are out there to reach out to uh, Colby and have a conversation with him about his technology. Yeah, please do. So um, please, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. So it's just uh, Colby Harvey. Uh, and, um, and the email that you can always reach out to us as well as info at rise.io. Uh, and we'd, I'd love to talk to you, anyone with any questions or, or you know, is interested in the technology and, you know, and, and really work with you and go from there. So you just like to talk about drones and stuff, huh? <laughs> They're cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Cool. All right. So listen, reach out to Colby Harvey um, with his company Rise at, on LinkedIn um, at Colby Harvey, or you can reach out to him at info at rise.io. And uh, if you want to reach out to Larry or I, you can reach us just by going to Google and typing in hashtag digital aircraft. You'll see everything about us. Or you can reach out to us um, on our email addresses, mark at digitalaircraft.org. And we'd be happy to have a conversation with you as well about recovery in aviation. Hey, guys, thank you so much for joining um, in this broadcast today. I really feel like it was informative. And I think you got a great business concept, Colby. And I'm looking forward to seeing your success. I appreciate that, Mark. And thank you for having me on. Yep. Thanks, Thanks Larry. Larry. Thank you, Larry. Yep. Thanks, Mark. All right. And as I close all of our broadcasts all the time, I wanted to say fair winds and following seas to you. And I want to wish you guys a great day. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.